This futuristic urban river canyon reflects a staggering amount of resources, capital, and innovation. It's also America's railroad hub and the central node in its extensive system of navigable fresh waterways. Its roads lead to most corners of the continent, and its runways send direct flights to over 200 destinations. All of this supports one of the planet's most productive regions for growing crops and extracting raw materials. The opportunities available in and around this prairie boomtown have attracted hungry young workers for nearly two centuries. In fact, so many arrived daily that it sustained the highest population growth rate on Earth for several consecutive decades in the late 1800s. But instead of allowing haphazard expansion, planners took advantage of the area's remarkable flatness and laid out the most orderly grid ever imagined. Now, more straight streets and uniform blocks exist here than anywhere else. This is the making of modern Chicago, the crossroads of America. The crown jewel of the post-industrial United States has a metropolitan population of 9.5 million and an economy considered by some experts to be the most balanced and resilient on Earth. Its story began when a Haitian-born fur trader and his wife, a member of the local indigenous Potawatomi tribe, established an outpost here in 1779. It remained a sleepy frontier village for decades until Chicago's first locomotive, the Pioneer, made its inaugural trip out to nearby Des Plaines in 1848. I learned about this pivotal moment firsthand when I visited the Chicago History Museum for a trip back in time with Paul Derica. So from those very humble beginnings in 1848, the railroad industry really takes off. And, and Chicago is ideally suited to become a kind of center of, of this growing industry. It's all the kind of raw materials that they're producing, right? All the agricultural materials, the livestock, the lumber, the ore, all of it can come via the railroad into Chicago. And then within the city, all of those goods can be processed. Lots of different things can be manufactured and they can be then kind of sent out to the growing Western states, but also to the well-developed Eastern states at that time. These products were listed in mail order catalogs, an industry invented and based in Chicago. The conveniences of online shopping can be traced directly back to Montgomery Ward and Sears, businesses that were only possible because the railroad reliably delivered. By the beginning of the 20th century, Chicago had close to 40 different railroad lines running through it. Most cities today will have like maybe one Union Station or a Central Terminal, but by the early 1900s, Chicago had six different ones. Chicago was also responsible for the rapid growth of the vast prairies that stretched westward to the Rocky Mountains. A Chicagoan had invented the mechanical reaper, freeing wheat farmers from the back-breaking, inefficient work of harvesting their crops by hand. And when they shipped their wheat back into the city, 12 massive grain elevators stored it before it was sent across the lake to Buffalo or downriver and onto ocean liners waiting in New Orleans. Within a handful of years, Chicago had displaced ports in Russia to become the world's largest mover of grain. But even with this bounty, prairie farmers couldn't build much of anything because their lands had few trees to harvest. Good thing there were expansive forests in Wisconsin and Michigan north of Chicago and soon it became the world's largest lumber market. The scene on the south branch of the Chicago River, you cannot witness anymore. It does not exist in Chicago. It doesn't exist actually, I think, anywhere in the world. Stack after stack after stack of lumber, all waiting to be shipped on downstate in Illinois, out to Iowa, on to Nebraska or Kansas. There are cases where entire prairie families are standing out there in this windswept prairie bog, waiting for their town to arrive. Bar, chapel, Houses, it's already made in Chicago. It's stamped on it, made in Chicago, along with the Reapers and everything else. Here comes the town. Almost overnight, Chicago had transformed this expansive grassland into the world's breadbasket. But these farmers also produced protein, 
By the early 1860s, you have this immense railroad network that makes it very easy for livestock to come into the city, be processed, and then kind of sent out to other parts of the country. And so a group of meat packers get together and they decide that they need basically a kind of central district where they can kind of rationalize the processing of livestock. And so on Christmas Day, 1865, the Union Stockyard opens. This immense area to the south of the city's business district, employing you know, tens of thousands of people. The smells and conditions these workers were exposed to were incredible. Up to 75,000 pigs waiting for slaughter could be penned at the same time. In about 15 minutes, the hog goes through this process of passing about 125 or 150 people, depending on the packing house. This was new. This was the modern. This was the Industrial Revolution at its most dramatic, its starkest. Hundreds of millions of calories were now passing through the processing plants and storage facilities of Chicago every single day, feeding the ravenous Union Army in its hard-fought victory in the Civil War. But there was a cost to all this activity. Chicago is situated magnificently for trade, but it's a pestilential swamp. It's a horrible place for a city. It's an absolute hellhole. Children were playing with maggots as if they were little pets. Before long, cholera had crept up the Mississippi to kill 60 Chicagoans a day during the warm summer months. It's a devastating disease, and it's very difficult to watch someone with cholera because they become violently ill and often die within hours. The culprit was the putrid waste all the residences and industries dumped, only some of which made its way into the rivers and canals. To find a solution, Chicago brought in Ellis Chesbro, one of America's brightest sanitation engineers. He designed gravity-fed sewers to flush the waste into the river, and then deep into the river by dredging it, and using the fill to raise Chicago's ground level 10 feet. Lifting all the existing buildings safely required widespread adoption of a new system, George Pullman's jack. The Pullman method was to put the foundation of the building on jacks that could be turned. You might have a thousand jacks around the base of a big building and 250 men blow a whistle and little by little they would jack up the building and other people would be putting bricks in around to, to shore up the foundation. The new sewers worked as planned, but the sewage still ended up contaminating the city's source of drinking water, the lake. One of the McCormicks writes to the old man, Pop, he said I was up at Clark Street Bridge and I'm looking in the river scarlet. Can you imagine that? There's heads of pigs in the river and things like that. And this is what's flowing out into the lake. Officials ordered tunnels dug to water intake houses called cribs, built miles into the lake to get beyond the stagnant pollution and send clean water back to the city. This worked until it didn't. Whenever there was a big storm, so much dirty city runoff washed into the lake that it threatened to reach the intake cribs, which would render them useless. At a certain point in time, it just proved untenable to just keep on building longer and longer pipes to try to get cleaner water that's farther out in the lake. Desperate to solve this problem for good, Chicago again turned to Chesbro, who drew up a truly audacious mega project. His solution? Permanently reverse the direction of the river so that it flowed west toward the Mississippi instead of east into the lake. It was a feat never before attempted in human history. A manipulation of the natural world so fantastic that many Chicagoans simply thought it couldn't be done. So how could you reverse the flow? Well, you must realize that the landform drops off. When you get down to the city of Joliet, you're 40 feet below Lake Michigan. The idea was to link up the south branch of the Chicago River with the Des Plaines River and to break through that subcontinental divide. If you could dig deep enough, gravity would then pull it all away from the city. 
Thousands of laborers spent years digging across the state of Illinois, trying to cut a massive 28-mile canal through rocky soil. You can just imagine these tremendous explosions happening and these newfangled machines that were really being developed and invented just particularly for this project. When they had finally finished and were ready to let the water in, they still weren't positive it would even work. But after a few tense moments, amazingly, the water began to flow slowly downhill. Chesbro and those who saw the project through to completion after his death were heroes. That's the beauty of Chesbro to the city fathers. He comes in, technology will solve it. He's fed it at banquets because he allows Chicago to grow without changing anybody's behavior, without controlling any of the economic interests who are dumping in the river. And they can continue to use that river as a sewer and send that garbage downriver toward less powerful and complaining canal towns. Not only did the canal eliminate Chicago's sanitation and drinking water crisis, but its sheer size and depth suddenly unlocked the cheapest mode of transport, river floating barge. At the dawn of the 20th century, the canal, combined with the railroads and all the industry based in the city, had cemented Chicago's place as the crossroads of America. Next, in part two of this four-part series, we'll examine how Chicago overcame one of the greatest urban disasters ever to become the fastest growing city in the world, just in time for it to host one of the most spectacular events anyone has ever seen. <laughs> 